to say about this, but uh, the message is loud and clear. What tribe was he again? Chefs started bringing meals 
the notices one after the other. They don't bring everything and place it on the table at the same time. They, it comes when it is steaming and sizzling. And uh, of course they would begin with him. And because I think he has eaten too much of those things, he would, he would just, some, he doesn't even talk sometimes, he just does like this. <laughs> Archbishop was also busy talking with him. <laughs> so, it would take a little, it would take a little, but whenever they came to me, I would say yes, please. <laughs> Beautiful, magnificent sight. 
And I remember on that very trip, one of the uh, priests that we had traveled with became so excited when he got to that point. He started talking too much. <laughs> he said so many words that he even said, I wish I, I, I had a problem. I'm told in Israel they have the best medical services. You know, I wish I had a problem so that I could you know, use this opportunity to, to, to access the medical services. A priest, in fact, is now a bishop. So it's a true story. I'm not just here to start any class. And as we began to stop on that mountain, he actually uh, skipped a step and fell and fractured his, uh, his body. And so, uh, true to his dreams, he was rushed to one of the hospitals in Israel and he came back to Uganda when he had a plaster of Paris. You know that, that, that big thing, that's what it's called. And, and a walker. He came back limping. Good for him. <laughs> and so, you don't play, you don't play games in, in the Holy Land. You're moving, you're literally moving in the footsteps of Jesus. That's the very place where Jesus walked. And so, that is where the court was. And Jesus is now giving commands. Anybody says what 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 do you want to do? They will they must have it. And this is coming in fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy, Zechariah chapter 9, which had talked of a king riding on a colt, on a donkey. There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is one of them. So Jesus purposes to ride into Jerusalem as the king. And he wants it to be made public that the Messiah, the long awaited for Messiah, and the king of Israel has come. He receives the worship and praises of men because he deserves the praise. And so no longer does he say, no, 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 don't refer to me as a king, don't refer to me as God. This time he accepts people to shout praises and they worship him openly. They even spread their cloaks uh, to pay homage as a sign of royalty. Raw, not law. Law and law anyway. Because he's a king. And by the way, all those are also uh, a fulfillment of what was written. For example, that had been written in 2 Kings uh, chapter 9, verse 13. So, Jesus is worshipped. He's worshipped. He accepts the worship. Unfortunately, the praise that the people were lavishing on him was not because they necessarily recognized him as their savior, the one they had been waiting for, the one who saved them from sin. Some of them are simply worshiping him in ignorance. Did I say some? Most of them are simply worshipping him in ignorance. To many, they thought their relief had finally come. Jesus had come as a savior who would deliver them from the Roman rule, who would probably lead them into a revolt against Rome. And so the people who had been waiting for a long time 
who had been yearning for a king now began to exalt him. Somebody who would break the rule of the Romans and restore Israel to a place of honor and recognition. Somebody who would solve the problems of Israel. And so those are the ones who hailed him as king with their many hosannas, recognizing him as the son of David who came in the name of the Lord. But when he failed in their expectations, when he refused to lead them in a massive revolt against the Roman occupiers, the crowds very quickly turned on him. They turned on him and they also turned against him. And within just a few days, their hosannas would change into cries of crucify him, crucify him. And so the crowd which sang Hosanna, Hosanna, is the same crowd that cried crucify, crucify. <coughs> and how many times have we worshipped Jesus by coming to church, by singing praises, by praying, and then the next moment that same Jesus is put aside. There was a lady, an East African revivalist, revivalist called Jureina, Jureina Mufuko. She was a renowned evangelist in, in Kigezi. And while she was telling us the story of how I think somebody had encroached on her land. And she said, I decided to put Jesus down, and I taught him a lesson. <laughs> you know? At that very moment, she was crucifying Jesus all over again. We crucify him when we see him. When you find yourself in bed with a man who is not your husband, you are crucifying Jesus again. When you find yourself constructing a house with stolen bricks, you are crucifying uh, Jesus over again. When you find yourself telling lies in order to get away with a situation, you are crucifying Jesus all over again. Of the Synoptic Gospels, only Matthew mentions the cold mother. The other ones don't talk about the mother of the cold. Perhaps this is to emphasize that it was a young cold, not yet weaned. Therefore, not yet ridden. So you can imagine a king coming on a cold that had not yet been, had been weaned, had not yet uh, been ridden. This is exactly what the team here was portraying. Somebody who is coming in a very casual way uh, to take someone's daughter. Why would a king ride on a colt? It was customary for kings and judges of biblical times to ride horses, especially when they were going to be anointed or coronated as kings. A horse is a sign of power, is a symbol of money. I have visited Kentucky in, um, in the U.S. several times. I went uh, sometimes to see people talking of KFC uh, here in the where I said, you, you are yet to see the, what Kentucky Fried Chicken is. Because of some of some of those things. Where they originally met. Now in Kentucky, Kentucky is known for horse riding. And I went, you know, 
one of those visits that took me to show all those things. And I was told a horse is worth one million dollars, some others two million dollars. The ones that they use for, for, for sports. You know? And so, imagine somebody coming with such horses, maybe seven of them. They display power. It's a display of power, a display of money, a display of influence and affluence. Normally, when you have power, when you have money, you have power. This is the other way around. Oh, vice versa. When you have money, you have power. You can talk, my friend. You can talk and people will listen to you. And uh, some of those older guys, you can tell by the way they walk and by the way they laugh. They don't, I've never seen a rich man laughing like that. It's a very laugh. So Jesus comes and the king, the kings, riding on a coat. Riding on a coat. But people worship him. A lot of palm trees suffered that day. And because there were so many branches of palms, the church, the Christian church, now, because of that commemoration, uh, came to call that Sunday, Palm Sunday, there were so many leaves and branches that were displayed for Jesus to ride on. But he comes to the court because he is a humble king. It's a display of humility. The horse, for us, the horse is the symbol of power. The donkey is a symbol of humility. It is also a, a sign of peace. It's also a sign of peace. The, yeah, it is also called, um, uh, what is, what is uh, uh, something to do with Baden, something of what. So it's, it's, it's Baden Sam, they call it the, the, the Beast of Baden, the Beast of Baden. So, it, it, it doesn't complain, you know, a very peaceful animal. Jesus, as he approaches Jerusalem, the Bible says in Luke's account, he looks at Jerusalem and weeps. He looked at Jerusalem and weeps. And as he's weeping, he's saying, before I leave you, what would bring you peace? Wish you knew what would bring you peace. You know, by the time the Son of God weeps, it is heaven. He wept when the sisters of Lazarus were saying to him, if you had been here, your friend would not have died. The Bible says Jesus wept. In John 11, 5, the shortest verse. And this is the second account where Jesus is weeping. He looks at Jerusalem. He weeps. And he says, Wish you knew what would bring you peace. Now, there were merchants in Jerusalem, very rich people. And Jesus is here saying, That money cannot bring you peace. That money cannot bring you peace. Uh, it's been said that money can buy a bed but not sleep. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Money can buy food but not appetite. Money can buy medicine but not healing. 
Now, I understand people who have a lot of money actually don't have a lot of peace. They build high fences around their houses. Then they, they lock, they put the half lock, four gates. And even when something just touches a gate, they get up. But some of us just go to bed. In fact, for me, when I put my head down, within five minutes, I'm already fast asleep. <laughs> now that doesn't mean they don't have money, they have some money. <laughs> Not too much, <laughs> especially if it is stolen, I think you feel insecure. But you know, I sleep like a baby. The other day, my daughter, our youngest daughter, was telling me one morning, she said that the rain was heavy. It was heavy rain, thunder, battery. I said, Really? Really? I had no idea. For me, when I sleep, the next thing I know is in the morning. So money does not buy this stability, but money does not buy this. <laughs> what about degrees? If degrees would bring peace, Makerere University, St. Francis Chapel, that has the highest concentration of brains, the, the biggest per capita uh, brain power, would be the most peaceful place to live on in the face of Uganda. Is that true for, for us here? Except for those who are born again. They have, they have, they have peace definitely, because they have the peace of peace in their hearts. Marriage! What about marriage? Marriage in itself does not create peace. In fact, uh, it brings a little bit of uncomfort. <laughs> you have been having your peace, you sleep when you want, you, you, you put your legs, you know, in the hair, you know, and then somebody comes and gives you a new push and you go and sleep. <laughs> you know? And then you say, my money, and then she reminds you, know, it's our money. <laughs> I have seen marriages that are suddenly on the rocks and they are bleeding. So marriage without Jesus speaks. It's not peace. So those of you who are suffering from uh, a condition called marriageosis, uh, bring, it, bring it to Jesus and he will heal you. Amen? Somebody say Amen. amen. And so the people shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, which is a Hebrew expression for save, save us if you will, save, save, save. And the whole city is stirred up. And there is only one question everyone is asking, who is this? Who is this? And, uh, and so, let me attempt to answer that, and then we shall be in for landing. I, I, I beg your uh, indulgence, because it's, it's, it's past one o'clock. But let me, let me uh, bring it to conclusion. Who is this? And the answer is in your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, from Genesis. And let me, let me summarize the whole Bible now. In Genesis, Jesus Christ is referred to as the seed of the woman who bruised the serpent's head. Did you know that all of us, all of us, are poor miserable seeds of men? It is only Jesus who is referred to as the seed of the woman. Amen? In Exodus is the Passover lamb. Leviticus is the high priest. In Numbers is the cloud and fire. Deuteronomy, Jesus is the prophet who is like Moses. In Joshua is the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he is the judge and the lawgiver. 
In Ruth, Jesus is the kinsman redeemer. In 1st and 2nd Samuel, the prophets of the Lord. In 1st and 2nd Chronicles, he is sovereign. In Ezra, Jesus is the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, the rebuilder of walls. In Esther, Mordecai is courage. In Job, the death spring from on high, the timeless redeemer. In Psalms, Jesus is the Lord who is our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, is the wisdom of God. In Song of Songs, Jesus is the lover and the bridegroom. In Isaiah, the suffering servant, the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, Jesus is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the son of man. In Daniel, the fourth man in the fire. In Hosea, Jesus is the bridegroom. In Joel, the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. In Amos, the burden bearer. In Obadiah, the mighty savior. In Jonah, the forgiving God. In Micah, the promise of peace. In Nehu, the avenger of God's healing. In Habakkuk, the great evangelist crying for revival. In Zephaniah, Jesus is the restorer of the remnant. In Haggai, the restorer of the lost heritage. In Zechariah, Jesus is the pierced son. In Malachi, the son of righteousness. What about in the New Testament? In Matthew, Jesus is the Messiah. Mark, the miracle worker. Luke, the son of man. John, the son of God. In Acts, the ascended Lord. In Romans, the justifier. In 1st and 2nd Corinthians, the last Adam. In Galatians, our freedom from the curse of sin. In Ephesians, the Christ of riches. In Philippians, Jesus is the God who meets our every need. In Colossians, the, full, the fullness of the Godhead. In 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Jesus is the soon coming King. In 1 and 2 Timothy, the mediator between God and man. In Titus, the blessed hope. In Philemon, the friend. In Hebrews, the everlasting covenant. In James, the great physician. In 1 and 2 Peter, the chief shepherd. In 1, 2 and 3 John, everlasting love. In Jude, Jesus is the God who is our Savior. And in Revelation, Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that's the one we commend to you. The only Savior Jesus, the Bible says, is only the name of Jesus that has been given power in heaven, power on earth, and there is no other name under the heavens, in the waters, that has been given the power to save, save the name of Jesus. He is a monopolist of salvation. And in his kingdom is no inflation. The Bible is very clear, and uh, as I conclude, there are three main characters I would like you to go with in this story. Character number one is Jesus, who is the perfect definition of the word humility. Character number two is the court, the court. A symbol of humility. Now, if that same court went to Jerusalem the following Sunday, it would not survive. It would not survive the wrath of those traders. And so you are simply a vessel. I don't know those of us who are highly placed various positions. You are simply a vessel. God has given you the privilege of carrying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then the third is the cult owners. They never resisted. When they do, the two disciples said the master needs the cult, they said they can have. Now that is a symbol of obedience. So two themes, humility and obedience. Amen? That's our take home, humility and obedience. Humility towards the people you live with. 
Jesus by becoming humble and displaying humility. He was not deprived of his divinity. So, humility is not a weakness. It is a strength. It is a power. I wish I had more time, but this is all we have time for. And I'm praying that the Lord will continue to bless you as you reflect on his word. As you say, Lord Jesus, there is room for you in my heart. I'm extending a warm welcome. Come into my heart. Come into my family. As King and the Lord of all. Let us all rise and pray together. Father, how we honor you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for this day when we commemorate the triumphal entry. And Lord God, we thank you for your humility. Even when we think of the fact that God departed the heavens to be born of a woman, that Jesus became an embryo, was born of a woman, Lord God, we can only pray that you will deliver us from pride, from tribal prejudices, from looking down upon other people who are not our class. Forgive us, Lord, forgive us. Even as we go out, we pray that Jesus will be exalted in our lives. Jesus will be exalted in our families, in our places of work. So, beloved, may the roads rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall softly upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. And may the blessing of God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you now and forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please join me in appreciating the joint hymn of fire. Blessing us. We can do better than that. We can do better than that. is by staying until we recess. So please stay until we recess and uh, enjoy the heat that is coming. Let us now go out into the world to love and serve the Lord. Amen.